being a consultant for the new Pride Agenda. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we, uh, I'll give a quick minute or two background uh, for those of you that may be new to us. Um, the, uh, a number of uh, LGBT advocates decided to form the new Pride Agenda um, uh, in, the, uh, in the wake of the dissolution of Empire State Pride Agenda. We felt there was more work to be done uh, particularly for people of color, for members of transgender, non-binary, non-conforming communities, um, um, immigrants, elderly, homeless, et cetera, and, and the, uh, the myriad of intersections of all those areas. So we've uh, started a little over a year ago. We have a very diverse, wonderful board of directors. We are an educational and advocacy, 501c3, and um, we uh, immediately uh, jumped in the pool and worked on significant legislation regarding LGBT rights, but also police reform and other issues in the course of the year. <clears throat> we uh, work on uh, not only legislation, but regulatory reform. Um, we were instrumental in, in uh, mandating state employees to have training on gender, transgender, so they could be responsive to the needs of members of our community. Um, we worked very hard on developing new models regarding PrEP outreach to communities of color, um, et cetera. Um, and just when we were ready to hit the community, COVID hit, and we pivoted to virtual town halls. We have had uh, virtual town halls twice a month since early April, uh, first on COVID, but then Black Lives Matter, police reform, integration, on and on. Um, one of our um, very exciting um, projects uh, was to work uh, with the Columbia School of uh, International and Public Affairs on an LGBTQ survey of, uh, about what the community cares about in terms of issue, how it feels about civic engagement, how it feels about local electeds, et cetera. So we're very, very pleased this evening to have a focus on uh, civic engagement. Um, my answer is always vote, vote, vote. And um, LGBT vote matters. So uh, with that as an introduction, I'm gonna pass it off to Ahmed Mohammed from our staff. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Cynthia. I'll keep this brief because we have a lot of cool information and panelists tonight. Um, I'm going over logistics. And so we encourage this to be interactive um, and putting your screen in gallery view allows you to see all of the panelists at the same time. You can do that by clicking a button at the top right hand corner of your screen. Um, in the spirit of being interactive, if you have any comments or questions, please use the chat um, and Q&A features along the bottom of your screen. I'll be funneling those to our moderator, Dan Teeth, um, who hopefully will be integrating those. Um, and then lastly, if any tech issues arise, please shoot me a text. I'll be posting my number also in the comment section and hopefully I can troubleshoot for you. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand it off to our stellar moderator, Dan Teeth, our very own. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dan Teeth. Uh, I'm a uh, a board member for a new pride agenda and i'm pleased to join this conversation on civic engagement this pre-election conversation we're less than two weeks away from november 3 it couldn't civic engagement could not be a more important subject than it is right now so um so i'm so glad that you're here i'm just i'm going to do just a brief sort of summary about what we're going to do this evening so we have about an hour um and we're going to hear from a handful of folks so the first person we're going to hear from is Dr. Esther Fuchs from Columbia. Um, uh, after that, uh, she can give us a brief presentation on a recent survey that we did that, uh, that Cynthia just referenced. Uh, after that, we'll hear from State Senator Zell Zellner Myrie, who's a Democrat from Brooklyn, who chairs the Senate's Elections Committee. Um, uh, we'll then hear from um, a newly elected uh, a district leader from Sunnyside, Queens, Amelia DeCodden. And then finally from Sheila Healy, who's a lobbyist in Albany for the new Pride Agenda and has a great deal of, of state advocacy experience. So let me start then with, um, with introducing um, uh, Dr. Esther Fuchs. Um, uh, Dr. Fuchs is a professor of international and public affairs and political science and director of the urban and social policy program at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, she served as a special advisor to New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg from 2001 to 2005. Dr. Fuchs has consulted for business, government, foundations, nonprofits, and political campaigns, and is a frequent political commentator and lecturer internationally. Uh, she received her PhD in political science from the University of Chicago 
and I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Fuchs to talk a little bit about the survey uh, that she's so generously done pro bono with, with uh, the new Pride Agenda. Unmute Esther. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I managed to get these slides up and uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, run through some of the data that we've just recently analyzed from a survey that we did with the new Pride Agenda uh, with Cynthia and Ahmed and the board of the new Pride Agenda. And our purpose was really, as Dan and Cynthia are saying, is really to try and learn about what are the issues that are of importance uh, to, the, to the LGBTQ plus community in New York City, and also to get a handle on what kinds of political activity uh, they do. Um, this is a political season. We have the, probably the most important election of our lifetime ahead of us. We're gonna have a mayoral election next year, which is also going to be extremely important. And um, I taught parties and elections for 20 years, had students telling me, oh, the parties are Tweedledum, Tweedledee. There's no difference. We all know there's a huge difference. And frankly, in this election, every vote counts. And for any organized group, it's important that elected officials understand and know what you care about. And hopefully this survey is the beginning of the development of a tool to add another dimension of voice to the LGBT community in New York. So here we go, just a little background on the survey design, because uh, it's very difficult to survey the LGBTQ community, because as many of you know, there is no census question. As, as Dan and I discussed earlier in the day about why it's so difficult to get a representative sample, um, you don't have a baseline to measure your own sample against through the census like every other group, uh, something that really should change in the next census. So we had, did what is called a purposive sample um, which was, we looked at, we sent our survey out online to 62,000 self-identified LGBTQ voters and allies uh, and partnered with 12 health, housing, social service advocacy and uh, service delivery organizations to disseminate the survey. The survey was done between June uh, and August and we had uh, 12, 1,263 responses which is a 2% uh, percent response rate, which is actually pretty good, believe it or not, uh, in this kind of a survey. And uh, among the respondents, there was 870 LGBTQ plus respondents and 225 non-LGBTQ plus respondents. And our survey is focusing only on the LGBTQ plus respondents and just so you understand, we provided a question that allowed self-identification of gender and sexuality and created the, the base uh, response category combining both of these questions. So what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of an overview of who responded to the survey, because as I said, it is not a random sample but it is a very interesting sample of LGBTQ uh, New Yorkers. And we'll begin with uh, a little bit of demographic data. The first data uh, chart is of um, sort of interesting distribution of our um, folks who by age. And this is actually a good distribution. We've got 3.7% uh, 18 to 24 year olds, 25 to 34 year olds accounted for 18.9% uh, our largest 
category is 65 to 74 year olds, that's 20%. But as you can see, um, it's, this distribution is um, a little top heavy on the older population, but we actually have a significant group within our younger population as well, which is, by the way, typical of those who respond to surveys. Uh, we also ask questions about housing and work status, given where we are in, uh, given where we are in the COVID pandemic, but also these are demographic questions which are important for understanding people's connection to their community and whether or not they're likely to be civically engaged at all. So we looked at renters and owners. It's a 68% split to 32% uh, between renters and owners, uh, which, is fairly, which is fairly representative uh, of the New York City population. And uh, in general, what we know is uh, owners tend to stay longer and are more connected to their communities. So at some point when we look at the data in this survey um, in more detail, we'll be able to determine differences along these uh, demographic characteristics. Uh, what was really interesting to me is time lived in New York City in your current residence. We've got 25% of our sample who only have been in their current residence for between zero and two years. Um, so it's kind of, then we have 32%, three to two years, 11 to 20 years, 16%, and 20 years plus is 26%. So obviously in our sample, we've got a lot of folks who have been in New York a long time and are not leaving New York. And so within this population of the gay community, um, we know these are keepers. These are people who are here staying. They are not moving away because of COVID. Um, this is very important from a political point of view because these are the people who are more likely to engage politically, have their voices heard and vote. And on the employment status, what we find 55% are working full time uh, the m biggest categories, and we have 25% retired, which shows you, you know, our data is skewed to the older LGBTQ population. Um, so we'll move into the political participation uh, part of the survey. To me, this is very exciting data. We were targeting um, voters. So the folks that we sent our survey out to were likely voters. That was the intentional target for this survey. And what we found was that not 97% of our respondents um, are registered to vote. Uh, that is huge, uh, by the way, as compared to what is the normal distribution in the city's population. Then what we also found is that not only are they registered to vote, but they actually vote. Um, you actually vote, I should say. Uh, and we had looked at whether you vote, we asked people whether they voted in the mayor's race, the governor's race, the presidential, the last presidential rate. And this is pretty extraordinary. So this is a very highly motivated group, high political participation, high levels of voting, 96 percent in the presidential race and 92 percent in that last mayor's race where there wasn't even any contest as some of you might remember um, you know this is there that last mayor's rate had a 30 percent turnout rate so the fact that this population voted at that high levels is very important now we're going to jump right into issues because that was part of the reason to do this survey, which was to find out what are the issues that uh, this population of LGBTQ likely voters cares about. Um, and if anybody asks you whether or not your voice is louder if you vote, there's tremendous amount of research that shows that political candidates and representatives listen a lot more to the people who actually vote. So demonstrating that this is an active voting community is very important in getting issues on the agenda and getting your voice heard. 
So this was really important. And if you bear in mind the population in our survey sample, um, these were mostly more wealth, more uh, older, established, um, also wealthier LGBTQ plus voters. Yet here's what they said were their top issues. So we asked people to rank what issue was number one for, for them as a ser from a series of issues that we presented to them. 29% of our sample ranked public health number one national issue. Number one national issue. They didn't say taxes. They didn't say, uh, you know, they didn't even say the economy. 29% said public health number one. 16% said race relations number one. 11% said income inequality number one, 9% environment and 8% the economy. So uh, this is a very progressive population that's concerned with the broad range of issues on the national scene that affect everyone. Um, and this is very important and especially um, low income populations. And as Dan pointed out to me earlier, this is somewhat of a, a reflection of our sample, which is that we did have um, social service organizations uh, and not-for-profit organizations do part of our outreach. But uh, it's, I think this is very important because this is not your typical this is my self-interested uh, list of national issues. This reflects deep thinking about what's important for the whole community. And you see the same thing in the New York City issues. 34% uh, ranked affordable housing as important to New York City first. 19% public health, 11% police misconduct, 9% homelessness, and 5% public education. And then if we continue to the uh, final slide on issues, we also asked what are the most important issues to the LGBTQ plus community. And so you can see some overlap and some divergence, which is really interesting. 29% ranked hate crimes as the number one issue for the gay community. 17% general health care, 15% homelessness. This is, you know, this is an issue where we have a population of renters and owners who are ranking homelessness, 15% are ranking homelessness first. This is not an issue that is personal to them or reflects their self-interest. This is an issue that's person that is really important for the broader community and, and, and it's reflected in the data. Same thing with 15% saying housing insecurity, and 8% saying employment uh, discrimination. So this is, I think, uh, you know, a very important uh, finding in terms of the issues that the LGBTQ plus community uh, cares most about. Now, um, this chart is uh, probably a little small. I hope you can see it. But we asked uh, everybody because we're of COVID-19, we didn't want to ignore the fact that we were in a pandemic and that the pandemic is creating a budget deficit. Uh, I know the state senator will talk about this and we know that there are going to be cuts in the budget. And so we asked whether or not you were, respondents were concerned uh, about cuts in state funding for LGBTQ related services. And then the second uh, graphic reflects um, reflects fun, uh, fundings in, uh, are you concerned about city funding in LGBTQ services? The chart is pretty self-explanatory. 47% um, are extremely concerned about cuts to these services and 50 in the state funding and 50% are extremely concerned in, in the city funding for uh, LGBTQ related services. And usually what we do is combine the two categories of moderately concerned and extremely concerned. You can see where the graph skews to the high end of serious concern about where the budget cuts are going to take us as it relates to these issues. 
finally, uh, we put this in because, you know, if you have to really understand, and I'm sure you do because you're on a webinar, that the web is one of the most important forms now of political communication. And that there are some recent studies about the relationship between web use and whether or not people will engage in traditional forms of uh, political behavior. And there's a great deal of concern that people will not go out and be active because they're stuck on the web all the time and that they will consider, you know, just being on the web as their major form of political behavior. So I, I love this uh, web motivated political participation. Um, we found out we asked the question, have you taken any of the following actions because of something you learned about or discussed on the web? So the first graphic is contacted a senator, congressman, or other elected official. Over 76% indicated that they actually did that on the basis of information from the web. Uh, this is way greater than the uh, general population but also very important and um, positive for the community in terms of their own political strength. Attended a political meeting or demonstration, 72% said they did as a result of information they learned on the web. And um, finally, uh, the, um, so these are, this is, uh, this is I think just in any event, uh, very, very important for people to recognize that the community is actually out there engaging and isn't sitting on their couch uh, watching webinars all the time. Okay, um, our final graphic is just the help you to understand the demographics of our survey. Um, we overlaid it on a map of New York City. And uh, to look for the highest concentrations of the population that we surveyed where they lived, because we know uh, to a very large extent, uh, politics is very much geographically based in terms of our system of representation. So uh, the darkest colors represent the neighborhoods which had the highest concentration of LGBTQ likely voters. This is very important for uh, electeds to understand that not only uh, they need to know that they have LGBTQ voters in their community and that they vote. So this population is a population of voters. And so we can see uh, no surprises to anybody that in this particular sample, the neighborhoods of Elmhurst, Prospect Heights, the Upper West Side, the Village in Chelsea, Morningside Heights and the West Side in general and East Harlem uh, are all, are the high concentration areas uh, for our survey. So uh, that is really the end of my presentation. Obviously, I could have talked for a very long time. There's really lots more data, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what the work that the New Pride Agenda is doing, uh, um, how it reflects, I think, uh, creating a powerful advocacy organization by collecting this data that I believe will be an important way of demonstrating uh, to elected officials that LGBTQ plus community not only engages in, not only watches the news, engages in politics and political behavior, but goes uh, to the polls or sends it through the mail and votes. So uh, those of you on the webinar, I'm gonna echo what the previous speakers have said. Uh, it's time to reflect this survey and make sure that you vote in this election. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. We're gonna, we're gonna have you give us back the screen. Yes. Um, and I think we'll hold on any um, comments or questions for the moment and um, in turn to State Senator Zelda Myri. Uh, Zelda Myri is a Brooklyn native and affordable housing advocate serving the 20th Senate District, which is in central Brooklyn. Um, uh, he's in his, we're just now finishing his first term. Um, and during his first legislative session, uh, Senator Myri served in leadership roles on several major legislative victories. 
having grown up in a rent-stabilized apartment at the epicenter of the affordable housing crisis. Senator Myrie was honored to co-lead the Senate's Housing Reform Work Group, which produced New York's strongest affordable housing and tenant protection laws in generations. During the legislature's budget negotiations, Myrie also served on the Senate's Criminal Justice Reform Working Group, resulting in sweeping reforms to cash bail, discovery, and speedy trial laws. As chair of the Elections Committee, Senator Myrie led hearings on public financing of elections and automatic voter registration and presided over historic election reforms, including early voting, closing the LLC loophole, and many other crucial reforms to protect and expand our democracy. Um, Senator Myrie derives his inspiration for his public service from his mother, who moved to Brooklyn 40 years ago from Costa Rica on the promise of a mattress in a friend's apartment and a job at a factory. Myrie is a graduate of Brooklyn Technical High School and earned his BA in communications and MA in urban studies from Fordham University. He later earned his JD from Cornell Law School. Thank you for joining us, Senator Myrie. Uh, Dan, good to be with you and uh, good to be with the New Pride Agenda. Let me first thank you for inviting me and having me and uh, to be with an esteemed panel. I uh, was really enjoying Professor Fuchs's presentation and I uh, would love to see more of that information. I saw on one of the last slides that um, Prospect Heights, which is a neighborhood that I represent, um, uh, was, was very highly represented in, in, in the survey responses. And so, uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time because uh, I'm hopefully uh, hoping that we can get some, some time to engage and, and have some exchanges. Uh, uh, but I do want to start off uh, with what I believe to be the most important task for anyone that is watching this uh, and anyone that will be in this arena um, uh, tonight. And that is make sure you have a voting plan if you have not voted already. Uh, please, please, please come up with that plan. We have three ways for you to vote now in New York. All right, you can vote in person on election day, November 3rd, which also happens to be my birthday. So I am hoping um, uh, that I can have a very, very celebratory birthday this year. Um, so you can vote in person November 3rd, the traditional way. You can vote early. We passed early voting in the beginning of 2019. I was the sponsor of that bill. That was the very first bill this Democratic majority passed. You can vote early starting Saturday. I'm having a big kickoff uh, on Saturday in Brooklyn. I'll be voting early uh, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, at the Brooklyn Museum. Please, please utilize early voting. We have from October 24th to November 1st. That's from Saturday to Sunday, nine days. The schedule shifts each day on the weekdays, on the weekends. Please, please, please go vote in person if you can. But if you cannot vote in person, uh, for whatever reason, you can also vote by absentee. Now, just here in New York City alone, the, the New York City Board of Elections has already issued 1 million absentee ballots. 1 million absentee ballots that people have in their homes right now. So you have the option, if you, if you, you know, for whatever reason, don't wanna go in person, put it in the mail. And if you're gonna do it, do it tomorrow, first thing. Uh, what we saw in the June primary uh, was people sending it a little too close to the election. The United States Postal Service couldn't really handle it. Uh, so I would encourage you, if you plan on voting by absentee, hopefully you have that already. If not, uh, we will drop it in the links how you can request it. Uh, please, please, please utilize that option. But what I'm doing, what I'm encouraging everyone to do is to vote in person if you can. Uh, and so please, starting this Saturday, you'll have that opportunity. You know, I think one of the slides um, not one of several of the slides that Professor Fuchs um, uh, presented really speaks to this issue. I, of course, there are policy areas that are specific to the LGBTQ plus community. We addressed some of those in the last legislative session. In this session, uh, we passed the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act. Um, previous to that, it was legal for people to, to discriminate against you in the housing context, the education context, in the work context based on how you expressed your gender. We passed that in 2019, knocked that off the books. We also banned conversion therapy here in New York. Uh, this is something that is barbaric, archaic, had no business being in our laws and being allowed. We banned that in 2019. Uh, but we also uh, made some, uh, set, you know, we, 
we advanced some policies in the veteran context and for folks who were discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, we expanded those benefits uh, so that they would be able to access them. Uh, and we still have much more work to do in this space. Uh, what is commonly known as the walking while trans ban, uh, we're ordering for the purposes of prostitution, is a bill that has not yet passed. We have enough sponsors, including myself in the Senate, uh, to make some movement on that. Uh, so we're gonna be pushing for that this legislative session. But those are not the only things that matter to this community. Uh, and as the professor pointed out, uh, housing is an LGBTQ plus issue. Criminal justice reform is an LGBTQ plus issue. Healthcare is an LGBTQ plus issue. All of these things matter and not to burst anyone's bubble, but it's nice what we have to do on the federal level and there's an existential crisis there but many of these issues are most pronounced locally. Uh, they have the greatest impact on you locally. So what does that mean? That 97% that the professor said are registered to vote, make sure that you are voting all the way down the ballot uh, because the state Senate matters, the state assembly matters, your local council um, matters. And that can be here in the city or in a town or village outside of the city these things are so important and there are things that you might not even think about that apply to the entire state not just new york city for instance did you know that polls opened at different times depending on where you were in the state so here in new york city we were used to okay 6 a.m to 9 p.m you got as much time as you can to vote but there were places outside of new york city that could not legally open their polls before 12 p.m and so they had a shorter amount of time to vote than you did just based on their geography. Now, there are many reasons for this and there are um, some political reasons that you know, we're not gonna get into, uh, but the reason that I bring that up uh, is that what you do, the local elected officials that you vote for, they don't just affect the big cities. Uh, this has an impact across the state. Uh, and we were, luckily we were able to change that law so that now it is uniform across the state from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, but these are the little things that you don't catch on to or that they're not as sexy and they don't make the headlines. Uh, but these are what we, state elected officials, local elected officials, this is the stuff that we fight for. And so I encourage everyone, please, 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 know who your local reps are. Know the issues that you care about. You know, we saw a slide on the presentation that talked about engagement with your local elected officials. This past June, I was peacefully protesting uh, in front of the Barclays Center in the wake of George Floyd's murder, uh, and I was pepper sprayed and arrested by the New York Police Department. Now, I had my bright neon shirt on uh, with my name emblazoned on the back, and it still didn't save me from being brutalized. Now, that was a very painful experience for me, uh, but we were able to turn that pain into progress because 12 days later, we were in Albany passing, repealing, doing all sorts of police reform things that we would not have been able to do otherwise. The repeal of 50A, a special prosecutor, um, all sorts of issues that matter to this community that could only be done at a state level. It required everyone to be engaged. I got more emails on the repeal of 50A than I have gotten on any single issue in my last two years. And I say that without exaggeration, thousands of emails, so much engagement. And so to my colleagues who were not predisposed to passing police reform, they had nowhere to hide uh, because the public was so engaged on this particular issue. And what, what does that tell us? Uh, that if we continue to be engaged, if this community continues to be engaged, that we can fight for the things that matter most to us. And so I'm really excited about uh, what, what we have coming up. I share everyone's anxiety about what's gonna happen on November 3rd, uh, but I try not to worry about the things that I can't control. There are things that you can control, and that is how you vote and when you vote. Uh, and so I'm gonna end with that and encourage folks, please, 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 come up with a voting plan. Make sure your friends have a voting plan, your family has a voting plan. If you're talking to somebody on the phone and you guys are talking about whatever you're talking about, Make sure you end the conversation with, and I know you have your voting plan, right? Uh, this is also a great conversation starter. 
you have someone that you like, you think they look good, you want to shoot your shot, slide in the DM and say, hey, what is your voting plan? Perhaps we can go vote together. Do what you have to do. Make it, make, make it as fun as possible uh, because the democracy is in your hands. So again, thank you so much to MPA. Uh, and thank you to Dan uh, for the invitation. And I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much, Senator. And you know, I was your, your last comment there, I'm just thinking about the kinds of fun you could have on a date in a, in a line to vote. I mean, just think about the excitement of that, fresh air, hanging out, things, the things you could learn while you're in line. That's right. Um, and I also really love that you mentioned, you know, protest as civic engagement um, and how much that moves elected officials. We can see that protest on the ground made a huge difference in the way in which you're talking about from this spring. I want to just pose two quick questions to you and then maybe Amelia as well will, will weigh in um, on, on some of that. Um, one is, uh, of course, there's the election reforms that have happened already, so early voting. Might you mention a few others? There are some that require constitutional, state constitutional change. So maybe if you could just mention a few others that are sort of in process and that we're looking forward to. Yes, absolutely. And so um, I, you know, I've been very fortunate uh, to chair the elections committee because we've uh, had a really, really active session uh, uh, these past two years. And you know, we've had um, about 57 changes to the election law, uh, which is really unprecedented and a testament to what happens when you get a Democratic majority in the state Senate. Uh, but there are a number of things that we passed that require uh, an amendment to the Constitution. Uh, and that requires us to pass it in two consecutive legislative sessions, which means we'd have to pass it in either 2019 or 2020, uh, and then again in 2021. Uh, and there are two things that are elections related that I think are gonna be important to opening up our democracy. One is no excuse absentee voting. Now, what does that mean? What, a bunch of you have requested your absentee ballots and you've had to check the box to say uh, that this is COVID related uh, and that's why I am requesting this absentee ballot. What no excuse absentee ballot means is you don't have to provide an excuse. Uh, there are many jurisdictions that do it this way. You say I want it, you get it. No excuse, no further steps, makes it as easy as possible. The second is same day voter registration. Uh, and this, again, is something that other jurisdictions do uh, that empower people to be involved. I believe that our voter registration process, um, while not insurmountable, uh, still is a little too difficult and it, it requires too many steps. Uh, and so what same-day registration says is, um, look, I'm not, I haven't been involved, I haven't been civically engaged for whatever reason, uh, but today is the day. Uh, and you get to walk in, you get to register to vote, you get to cast your vote, um, and still be, you know, enfranchised uh, because this is your democracy. Uh, and so those are, those are two things that uh, require us to pass them again at the top of the 2021 session, and then it goes to the voters in November for approval. So I'm very excited about that uh, because I do really believe that it opened up our democracy. Any thoughts on making Election Day a holiday? Yeah, so what we have, um, I think we're going to, we, we need some, some federal assistance on this. Uh, in New York, it technically is, uh, uh, but, but it's not what everyone thinks it is. Uh, uh, you are given a certain amount of time uh, to, to, to go vote. And if you, uh, uh, if you go over that time or if you want to take uh, more time, you cannot be penalized for that. Uh, but I believe that we really should have no work, make it a national holiday, uh, uh, just like we do for other things. Look, this is no disrespect to any other of our holidays, uh, but I think if we can take time off for some of the other things that uh, perhaps are a little sillier than democracy, um, uh, then I think we can, we can take a day off to give people every opportunity they can um, uh, to, to engage. And, and, more, and more importantly, uh, for those people who have um, uh, uh, obligations, this is part of why we passed early voting. If you are a single mom and you can't take time off of work uh, to vote, if you are a small business owner, and you're the person that has to run it, um, you can't leave to vote, uh, you shouldn't have to bear that. We should make uh, everyone, give everyone the ability to, to do this without consequence. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, now I'd like to move to the other elected official on this, um, on this uh, panel. So Amelia DeCodden is a 21-year-old transgender rights activist and recent graduate of the City College of New York. By the way, I should say my pronouns, he, him, his. 
Um, she first entered the world of politics at 16 when she volunteered on Bernie Sanders' campaign for president. Since then, she has been involved in numerous campaigns for federal, state, and local office. In October of 2019, she spearheaded a successful effort to amend the rules of the New York State Democratic Committee to remove unnecessary references to the gender binary and to accommodate the election of gender non-binary members. She is continuing her efforts to foster inclusion of transgender and non-binary New Yorkers through her project, Binary Free New York City. Uh, just this past June, Amelia was elected as one of two of the first openly transgender Democratic district leaders in New York City, representing the 37th Assembly District in Queens. In her spare time, she is a freelance web and graphic designer. Uh, born and raised in Westchester uh, in a family of French immigrants, she currently resides in Sunnyside. Welcome, Amelia. Ben, thank you for having me. Yeah, no, so I want to, you know, quickly piggyback off of what the senator was saying with regards to if you can vote in person, if it's safe for you and if you're able to, please do. I think we saw um, this past June, which was still closer to the beginning of the pandemic, but we have no reason to think that it's anything's really changed. We see that um, there are still some zones flaring up. Um, and so a lot of people voted absentee in order to you know, stay away from those tight spaces. A lot of people um, weren't able to vote early either because of time timing or because of the way that um, the locations were spread out. Some of them weren't accessible to most people. I know that the BOE is working on um, improving that for, for this election or I believe they have. Um, so a lot of people voted by absentee and what I witnessed firsthand uh, with my own election, for instance, and helping with others, um, is that the BOE is really overwhelmed with absentee ballots um, and they don't have the staff currently to count those ballots in a reasonable amount of time and there are still loopholes um, and mechanisms by which people's votes can be you know, not counted um or otherwise um delivered late um and past the day that the BOE is allowed to accept them um or otherwise disqualified so i definitely would recommend voting in person to help shore up the number of um votes that we know on election day so that the results can be determined more quickly um and just to make sure that your vote is counted Beyond that, though, I do want to talk about a little bit about how, um, you know, campaigning as a queer New Yorker has been like what my experience has been um, in New York in the 21st century. I think that um, a lot has changed since we've had the first people out people running for office in the past few decades. Um, I'm definitely really privileged to be able to um, engage in politics in this era. Like I definitely thank the people, including people on this call who came before me and um, for both, you know, pushing that boundary as well as um, pushing for policy changes specifically that makes it easier for um, queer people to run as well as for people in general to run. Cause I think that the issues are intertwined and you make the system more accessible to everybody. It lifts, you know, all group, all marginalized groups upward. Um, and I'm looking forward, you know, to other mechanisms like, you know, public financing of elections statewide um, that we have a form of coming up on this on the state level within the next two years, which I'm you know, confident is going to help more people who otherwise wouldn't have the means to run for office. Um, so I ran for a party office, which is, you know, relatively low level. It's unpaid. It's volunteer. Um, but it's still, you know, like a big a big um, responsibility to take on. Um, I had to convince myself and let myself be convinced by the people who, um, you know, broke me into to wanting to run for district leader that it was something I could take on. Um, I was used already to like in in like last October, so about a year a year ago um, this week after we passed the. Um, gender changes at the state committee, the inclusivity changes and the rule changes about the kind of abuse that being out in trans and politics um, that you receive in that state. And I was 
scared that that was something I was going to experience again. I think that um, there's something about the kind of transphobia that we're finding um, still exists, hasn't really gone anywhere, um, certainly hasn't gotten worse, I don't think, um, but hasn't really gotten better since um, trans people became more open and, and out in society. Um, it's it's something that finds itself still in, in so-called progressive circles and it's something that is very um, conducive to being transmitted online in a very systematic and oppressive fashion and so this time last year for me was really one of the worst times of my life and it really was something I considered in making my decision to run whether I wanted to put up with that again um, and thankfully I was able able to, um, you know, have a support network and tune those voices out. Um, but the fact that, you know, I come from a not terribly financially privileged, but at least financially secure background, and along with the fact that I'm white and living in New York City makes it easy for me to be able to ignore those voices and lean on the people who I know have my back. Um, for um, black and brown trans people, um, and uh, otherwise queer people, often enough they don't have those resources um, or they're running in, in communities or in you know, places outside the city that um, are otherwise not as accepting of queer people in general. Um, so I definitely reflect on that. I'm, I'm grateful that I was able to find myself in that position. Um, and I was also you know, surprised and um, pleasantly surprised that I didn't face you know, out transphobia from my opponent or um, from other institutions or, or actors within my, my community. Um, but it's still something that came up online. It's still something that um, people in other parts of New York City um, expressed and, and committed. And I think we still have a lot of work to do in order to make um, those kinds of, um, to make people like us really feel that taking on these kinds of challenges is something that they can do at the same level as as cis people um, and as uh, straight people. So it's definitely been a ride. I'm, I'm grateful to say that I've, I've, I've won and I am um, had been grateful for the opportunity to represent my community over the past few months and for the next couple of years. Um, and especially for the fact that the work that I'm you know, privileged to be able to do now is directly related to making that experience easier for, for people to come. All right, now I'm focused on um, both bringing the rule changes that I passed at the state level um, to the various county committees um, here in New York City. Um, right now, just the Democrats, if the Republicans want to have me, that's, that's up to them. I'm not very optimistic. Um, as well as working with legislators to amend um, the state election law in order to make the changes that we passed at the various levels, you know, workable. Um, right now, the Board of Elections has expressed um, in, in, in some situations that they're not really sure how to handle these. Um, and I don't wanna cause problems when people, when non-binary people are excited to run for office. Um, so that's what I'm you know, looking forward to and I'm just grateful to have the opportunity and um, yeah. Thank you so much, Amelia. You know, I wanna just say uh, on behalf of, I think all of us, um, thank you and you know just state our gratitude for your willingness to step up because and I think for Zellner too I think listen anybody who's willing to put themselves out there <laughs> in this way to run for public office and all that that entails um, I think many folks think about the upside of, of the, the power authority or respect would have you there's a lot of downside uh, and I think that's particularly true if you're coming from marginalized communities you're taking a risk and I think as a 21 year old transgender activist you took a genuine risk uh, and we all benefit from that in your experience. Um, I'm gonna turn now, I think, to Sheila, um, and then I think we'll circle back to, to questions from folks, because I think there's a, there's a for sure been a few questions coming across the chat with regard to the budget, which is gonna be in everybody's mind. Um, but let me just, and you know, the, the, the bio that I got for Sheila is incredibly long, so I'm not gonna read it all because of course Sheila's experience is incredibly rich and lengthy. I'm gonna start with noting that she was the LGBT coordinator for the current governor's daddy, Mario, 
Um, and, um, and so I know that, that she may hate me for aging her in this way, but um, she, it was terrific. She was terrific then, and we're grateful for her service then. She was in the Division of Budget, speaking of budget. Um, she's been a lobbyist for a long time. She's served in Albany for a very long time, was in Washington, D.C. for a period of time. Um, I've known Sheila for many, many, many years. I want to go so far as to say that she's an institution in Albany. Um, and she may hate me for that, too. But um, so Sheila has her BA from Indiana University in political science and an MPA from uh, Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs, where she studied as a fellow. Um, she's terrific. I'm so glad she can join us. Thank you, Dan. And it's so great to see everybody here. Um, one of the secrets, you know, as representing as a lobbyist for government relations consultant for the new Pride Agenda 501c3, the other hat that I have, okay, the other hat I have is campaigns. So uh, with one of the old Pride Agenda's original founders, Libby Post, she and I do local progressive campaigns uh, to get good people elected. So that's the other half of me that um, when I'm not focusing on policy and, and not pure electoral politics for the, the Pride Agenda. But one of the things that has so, been so amazing this year is, is when I started doing, working with the Pride Agenda, what was it, over a year and a half ago, the time has gone so fast, we did a lot of, because I live in Albany, so I have an upstate perspective, did live in New York City for a while, we visited with the community in Buffalo, Rochester. We talked with folks, with Andrew Stewart Cousins about her community down Westchester, Albany. Is It was very interesting to see the organization, the issues, and the political engagement of the upstate communities. And then when COVID hit, to have those same conversations with Buffalo, Rochester, we're planning one for Albany, and to have COVID strip away everything and get down to the essence, the inequities, the racism, the health disparities, and then to find what those communities are doing, particularly with Ahmed, who has been organizing the virtual town hall so we can have these discussions, and to find out that the black and brown LGBTQ plus people are on the edge of those movements, Black Lives Matter movement, health disparities movement, they are moving those issues in tremendous and impactful ways. So um, what we're trying to do is get educated in real time about how, how the different communities see those issues, how they prioritize them, and how we can take that information and intelligence and communicate it back to our state legislators, assembly members, state senators, like the wonderful uh, Zel Zelnor Myrie. And um, we've changed a lot of what our focus is. When I started, Cynthia, Cynthia, who has all kinds of background as a lobbyist, we were gangbusters 2020. We're going to do gender implementation, DASA implementation, double health and human services funding, get the funding upstate and really dig down deep. And then, of course, as you all know, the pandemic hit, and we had to pivot, pivot, focus, get educated, and really get in real time where those issues are. And in fact, we became very embedded um, with the police reform agenda that Zelnor was very much a part of, tracking each one of those bills, trying to weigh in, trying to find out how we can be helpful. So it's been, um, it's been a learning lesson for me, um, but um, it's also been extremely challenging for the Pride Agenda. And thank goodness for the board and, and everybody that's been affiliated who's able to move and understands, like Cecilia Gentili, Doug Worth, our co-chairs, Cynthia Demisa, Ned, Dan, I mean, Joey Presley, people have been moving, changing as soon as the information comes online, like this is what one of the communities cares about, upstate, downstate, this is what we pivot to. We try to provide that information going in the policy, the advocacy here in Albany and um, throughout 
all the legislators around the state because as Eldar said, it's so important. It, it's, we're looking at the national election. I mean, the last one I was really down the rabbit hole with was the Obama campaign, finding LGBTQ voters across the country. But here in our own backyards, we've got wonderful state senators running candidates in the Hudson Valley, Long Island, Rochester. Um, so the community is, we're working back and forth with them in terms of, you know, finding out what are their priorities, how to mobilize the community, get the support out there so that, for instance, I'm not supposed to be talking politics, but so that Andrew Stewart Cousins can have a plurality going into 2021, so that there is a whole a much more great opportunity to get bills that we care about and people in the black and brown communities where we're going to be working as allies with. Why? Because, hello, black and brown LGBTQ people are leading these efforts in communities across the state. So there's a tremendous amount of work to do. Over the next couple of months, we're going to be reaching out very intensively to caucus members on the assembly side, state senate side, to really engage, build relationships, listen to you know, how can we be helpful and to, to feed uh, to the legislators what's going on in their particular district or geographic region. And New York is huge. So this is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's with a few terrific people, we're trying to make this, this work. And I think with Esther's civic engagement survey for New York City, we're hoping to do that upstate um because that is just like terrific information the data and as a, D, a person that got raised up in the budget division i love data people love data so the more that i get the more that we can communicate uh budget information and uh you know we're facing without the federal stimulus funding we're facing tremendous odds to keep all the programs hiv aids programs programs that help the most vulnerable in all the communities, how we keep them going in 2021 is, um, is a daunting challenge. Um, and we will be working with the legislators uh, right here in Albany, uh, folk around the state to make sure that the LGBTQ priorities, including those that we're, we've been getting educated from Esther about, are prioritized and that we're weighing in. I mean, for the first time ever, I remember at the early on the COVID, Brad Hoyleman, Senator Brad Hoyleman, had um, one of his um, safe harbor bills where he was pushing. So we as a community, we as the new pride agenda had to get educated in real time. How does housing, how does this bill affect our community? And then make sure that we're advocating for housing issues. This is new. This is a whole new issue uh, to us, but, but we were successful. Brad got the bill passed uh, as well as the extension. And so we're gonna be doing a lot more of that. So um, that's a lot to cover. Dan, I hope it answered your question. Um, so we wear both the policy hats, mindful that it's always the politics on the ground and the need to get all of our community out uh, in a very active way uh voting poll watchers doing whatever they need to do to support the uh november 3rd effort so let me mention a couple of things thanks thanks so much sheila yep. so of course as a 501c3 we're not npa is not in the business of endorsing candidates without a doubt um and i urge everyone to you know uh, i saw that esther put out there where you can find out who's on the ballot have a look have a look at the issues have a look at their websites figure out who do I want a phone bank for, who might I want a canvas for, um, whether it's here in New York, we've got a bunch of competitive races here in New York, for example, uh, the, the congressional seat that's right now held by Max Rose, Staten Island and Southern Brooklyn, very competitive uh, with Nicole Maliotakis. Um, again, I'm not gonna tell you how to vote, but worth going to have a look at what the issues are there and how it matters. We've got several competitive uh, I mean, I may let uh, Zellner in a moment speak about some of the competitive state Senate seats, 
again, look at the positions of the candidates, figure out who you want to vote for. If you're in those districts, urge others you know in those districts to vote for them. Volunteer to be a poll worker. Poll workers have often been seniors, retired, many with health conditions. We don't want them, if, if they, you know, if they don't want, we don't want them to be there for all the obvious reasons related to COVID. Please, if you, if you can do it, you're feeling healthy, you're feeling up to it, go be a poll worker. Make that offer um, uh, wherever you are in New York. Um, I'm, I'm glad that um, we got a little bit on the budget because I do think I would love to hear Zellner for a moment talk a little bit about where the hell we're going to end up with that um, because the hole is huge. So go ahead, Zellner. Yeah, so, you know, this is, uh, is those of you, certainly the person who asked the question, uh, but for any of us who are involved in politics, you know that you show me your budget and, and I'll show you your values. Uh, and we know that uh, the budget is a direct, it's a policy document. Um, uh, it's not separate. It is, in fact, a policy document. Uh, and it is the biggest policy document that we have uh, in the state legislature. Um, and Sheila, of course, had a lot of um, uh, intimate knowledge of, of working through that process. Um, we are looking, uh, I think one estimate said over the next two years, a $59 billion deficit. Uh, we are operating uh, right now uh, at a deficit. There are pending cuts that the governor has withheld, um, waiting to see the outcomes of the federal elections and uh, how that pretends for uh, further help uh, for the state of New York. Uh, so, you know, it is an understatement to say that we are in uh, the, one of the most trying fiscal times uh, that the state has ever experienced. Uh, that said, all cuts are not created equal. And um, when it comes down to it, the marginalized communities, like the ones that I represent, always suffer the most under these cuts. Uh, it is something that has uh, infuriated me. Uh, in my time here. One example, uh, in the height of the epidemic, we had to pass a budget uh, and we got cuts to Medicaid where my district, I have four hospitals in my district that at the height of the pandemic were cut to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars. We didn't have access to rapid testing machines while more affluent neighborhoods, more affluent hospitals had two, three, four of those machines. And so, um, you, you know, the, the context is we have a lot of fights ahead. Um, and from what I saw in the chat, you know, um, I believe that the, the person asking the question uh, was concerned about funding for LGBTQ plus um, community initiatives and organizations. Uh, that is gonna be a fight uh, because the governor is gonna say, we gotta cut everything across the board uh, and everyone has to, to suffer, uh, but I don't believe that everyone feels that effect the same way. So what will help is partially what Sheila mentioned, we get enough uh, Democrats to have a super majority uh, in the state Senate, then we can push back a little more. We can offer uh, some counter forces uh, to those cuts, but it won't just be that. Uh, constitutionally, the governor has most of the power in the budgetary process. And so until we change that, uh, until we amend the constitution uh, to put the legislature on equal footing, uh, we're still going to be fighting some of the same fights. And so uh, that's all to say, there's a lot that's going to happen. Uh, gear up, uh, because it's going to be a big fight. Thank you, Zellner. I want to make mention of uh, just a couple other things that are on the ballot, at least in New York City um, uh, uh, right now. So there are five citywide ballot initiatives that focus on local elections, police oversight, government ethics probes, the city budget process, and public land use reviews. Um, I'm going to ask Ahmed if you can just slip into the chat a place that you can look up online um, what those ballot initiatives are, um, because those are worth paying attention to as well when you're voting. Um, given the time, I want to be mindful of, of, of closing on time. Um, so um, the, if there are final thoughts from any of the panelists. Vote early if you can. Vote early. Others. Just vote early um, or in person if you're able to. Otherwise, send in your ballot as soon as possible. Bring somebody with you. Bring a bunch of people with you uh, when you go. 
I'll certainly get on the vote early bandwagon. Um, definitely vote early. I am recommending to everybody through who's on the ballot.org, which is only New York City based, but it's got everything there that you need to know. Don't wait. If you, can, if you can't, if you have to do an absentee ballot, okay. But if you don't, just vote early. Uh, we want to be counted. Thank you all. I'm going to turn this to either Ahmed or Cynthia just for a, a final uh, couple of thoughts. Yes, thank you, Dan. Um, I just also wanted to plug, um, well, before I do that, I want to thank all of the panelists as well. Um, there's a lot of information and I took a lot of notes. Um, I also wanted to talk about an upcoming town hall um, we're going to have in November um, on women in politics and the electoral politics. We'll be having hopefully multiple perspectives, professors who do research, um, women who are the head executive directors of different organizations involved in electoral politics. Um, and so stay tuned for more details on that. Um, but I'll be sending everyone on here through their email address for more info on that in the next coming weeks. Um, before I say good night, Cynthia, do you want to say any final words? No, um, oh, Cynthia, go ahead. Dan, Dan, go ahead, please. I was just going to say thank you to all. Thank you so much to our panelists for joining us tonight and for your thoughtful words and for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, yes, I'm going to, of course, double that thanks. So many comments were so important. Um, Esther, thank you for your continual help with our purposeful survey. And um, all done pro bono. It's, it's amazing that people are of good, uh, of good heart and good intelligence um, <clears throat> will help organizations like the New Pride Agenda. Thank you, Esther. Um, Thank you. I just have to say you're inspirational, Cynthia, to all of us. And that's part of the reason we want to step up and do this work. Thank you. And I know Sheila too. So I'm, and Dan, all of you, I, we have young people here today, and but these are giants on this panel. And Delnor, I am a big fan <laughs> and I'm so delighted to be on this panel with you. So I wanted to just add my three cents into that. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Uh, and let, me just be, let me just be clear that the, um, that the, um, that our intention is to modify the survey and go statewide. We are a statewide organization. The only thing, our only challenge is money and funding and trying to do what we need to do, but we will get there. <clears throat> With all your help, we will get there. Um, uh, Amelia, thank you for your bravery in jumping into the pool. Uh, part of our focus is education, advocacy, and leadership. You are demonstrating leadership we look forward to learning from you and the kind of changes that you're gonna suggest uh, at every level. <clears throat> Senator, so nice to meet you. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I look forward to meeting you in person back in Albany or locally in New York City, no problem. Um, your comments regarding <clears throat> nowhere to hide and not all budget cuts are equal. We are painfully aware of that, painfully aware. Um, and uh, we look forward to continue to working with you, sir, really, respectfully, truly. And Sheila, my buddy, my partner in crime, so to speak, it's good crime, though. We're good lobbyists. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, just um, the, um, you know, for you to point out that LGBT community is part of every community, and the survey is showing it. So in addition to rights, we are all about equality and equity. Someone says, who's the new pride agenda? What are they doing? We care about equality and equity. Two words, equality and equity. And part of it is like getting in the queue. And part of from the beginning, the board of directors, Sheila, all of, I said, all of us said, we have to be at every table. If it's about housing, we care about housing. We care about taxes. Uh, we care about discrimination. We care about health care. And, and the fact that this survey is boldly, by generally white, wealthier, educated people speaking to issues 
Imagine if it were truly random in every community. And people are concerned about housing and a job and education. We are all just people. <laughs> we are citizens of New York and citizens of our country. <clears throat> I thank you all for what you are teaching, continue to teach us, and I continue to vow that we, the New Pride Agenda, will do all we can to continue our advocacy, education, and leadership development. We hope to be hiring an ED soon. By January, we have excellent applicants, uh, someone that will be visionary and representative of you. And uh, meanwhile, we'll, um, we'll keep the machine running. Little machine, little engine that could. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.